Hi, uh, my name is Jay Song Lee, and I function as the Secretary of Institutional Working Group 2 on Dispute Settlement. It's Working Group 2. Uh, it would have been a great privilege for me to join you today, but due to the time difference, I'm addressing you via a recorded video. First, many thanks to the organizers and Alexei for inviting Unse Chow to this event, and a big congratulations on the 30th anniversary of the Belarusian Republican Union of Lawyers. Today, I would like to touch upon the recent developments at Unse Chow in the area of dispute settlement. As you are aware, Unse Chow is a well-known name in the area of dispute resolution, but its scope of work is broader. In 1966, the UN General Assembly established the UN Commission on International Trade Law, UNCTRA, in response to the need for the UN to play a more active role in removing and reducing legal obstacles to the flow of international trade through the progressive harmonization and unification of the law of international trade. Therefore, the area of UNCTRA's work spans from international contracts, legal obstacles faced by micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises, electronic commerce, transport, secure transactions, insolvency, as well as judicial sale of ships. Now back to arbitration. It can be said that the international arbitration framework is solidly grounded on unsecured texts, beginning with the 62-year-old New York Convention, which provides a mechanism to enforce arbitral awards across borders, and which now has 166 state parties. The UNCTRA model law on international commercial arbitration has influenced arbitration laws around the globe. The 1999 arbitration law of the Belarus Republic is one of them, and we are in the process of assessing whether the 2014 amended version can be considered an enactment of the 2006 model law. In commercial contracts, you often see or find references to the UNCTRA arbitration rules, a comprehensive set of rules, procedural rules upon which the parties may agree for the conduct of arbitral proceedings. You may be also aware of the guidance documents, such as the Secretariat Guide on the New York Convention, the Notes on Organizing Arbitral Proceedings, and the recommendation to the arbitral institutions with regard to arbitration under the UNCTRA arbitration rules. In parallel, UNCTRA has worked towards establishing an international legal framework for commercial mediation. In fact, I'm very pleased to say that the Singapore Convention on Mediation, which was adopted in 2018 and provides a cross-border enforcement mechanism for mediated settlement agreements, entered into force in September this year, only one year after the convention opened for signature. This is indeed a remarkable achievement. Belarus also acceded to the convention this July and will enter into force for Belarus in uh, 15 January 2021. It is our hope and expectations that the Singapore Convention on Mediation will rise to the position and importance that the New York Convention has achieved for arbitration. And while the success achieved thus far is truly extraordinary, it is equally worth noting that for the conventions to reach its full potential and effect, we must continue our efforts and invite more states to ratify and accede to the convention. Along with the convention, the model law on international commercial mediation was adopted, updated uh, in 2018. And next year, during the annual commission session, it is expected that the revised mediation rules, along with the notes on mediation, as well as the guide to enactment for the model law would be finalized and adopted. This would complete the legal framework for international mediation as well. But UNCTRA's efforts do not end there. To address the challenges brought by the COVID-19 pandemic and explore how the legislative tools UNCTRA has developed can mitigate these negative effects, UNCTRA organized a series of virtual panels on UNCTRA texts and COVID-19 response and recovery in July of this year. The fifth of that series, hosted in partnership with the Vienna International Arbitration Center, discussed the impact of the pandemic in the realm of international dispute resolution. Overall, with the current circumstances brought by COVID-19, 
unsecured tax and work in international arbitration and mediation were seen as crucial as ever. The first panel looked at the immediate measures taken by arbitral institutions from across the world to respond to the COVID-19 crisis. In this regard, you will agree with me that arbitration practice has changed dramatically due to COVID-19. You have been hearing reports of increased use of digital technology to facilitate the conduct of the arbitral proceedings, including the use of online case filing tools, conduct of virtual or remote hearings, and the adoption of digital authentication or signature for rendering of the awards. While remote hearings are not new, the pandemic has caused its use to proliferate and there is great interest to maximize the efficiency of the arbitral proceedings through such means. The second of the panel examined how international dispute resolutions would likely evolve as a result of COVID-19, noting that the crisis had already accelerated changes that would have taken years to develop otherwise. And we need to take a look at the long-term impact of such changes. We'll likely witness a variety of innovative measures in dispute management, such as increased digitization and further use of technology, expedited procedures to adapt to the digital economy, the use of artificial intelligence, asynchronous hearings, and online platforms, which would all contribute to the shaping of future international dispute resolution landscape. The emergence of digital tools, such as AIs in arbitration, could also lead to changes in ways future legal professionals and arbitrators would be trained. Simplification and the relaxation of formal processes to enhance the time required for the arbitration process would likely become the norm. However, despite all possible future developments, we must not forget that the fundamental principles of arbitration, including party autonomy and the discretion provided to the tribunals while conducting the proceedings should be preserved as well as due process and fairness concerns. Now, let me come back to Unset Cho and its current and possible future work in dispute settlement. Uh, working group two is finalizing the provisions on expedited arbitration, expedited arbitration, rules that would likely accompany the Unset Cho arbitration rules, mostly like a, as an appendix. Uh, and these provisions aim at simplifying and streaming, streamlining the arbitral proceedings to save cost and time. The expedited arbitration provisions EAP, called EAPs as we call them, would only apply when the parties have expressly agreed to their application. There will be certain new requirements in the notice of arbitration and response there too. For example, to include a proposal of an appointing authority and the appointment of a sole arbitrator in the notice of arbitration. There will be a simplified process for designating and appointing authorities, a default of sole arbitrator, mandatory consultations with the parties at the early stages of the proceedings, including remotely and using technology, short-term timeframes, including for rendering of the awards, which would be six to nine months after the constitution of the tribunal, the possibility to not hold hearings, limitations on counterclaims and additional claims, evidence to be in writing, clarifications on arbitral tribunal's discretions with regard to written statements and evidence, and possibly a provision on early dismissal or preliminary determination. Uh, we'll be reviewing the draft arbitration rules of the International Arbitration Court Chamber of Arbitrators at the Union of Lawyers, but you may also wish to follow the discussions in the working group as you draft the new rules. Now, even before COVID-19, there was discussion in the working group about the use of technology in the arbitration process mainly for holding case management conferences, for hearings, and for taking evidence. The question is whether such a role should be provided in the expedited arbitration provisions. One view is that such aspects are key to expedited arbitration and should be expressly mentioned. Another is that the arbitral tribunals already had the discretion under Article 17 of the Unsecure Arbitration Rules, which state that the tribunal may conduct the arbitration in the manner it considers appropriate, provided that the parties are treated with equality and given a reasonable opportunity to present its case. All of this is with the aim of providing a fair and efficient resolution of the dispute. 
The working group discussed this question when it met in September and with no surprise in hybrid fashion with five delegates participating in person at the Vienna International Arbitration Center, uh, Vienna International Center, and about 200 or so delegations participating online from all over the world. As an official UN meeting with interpretation provided in all six official languages, it was not easy to convene and manage the meeting. Interpretation into six languages involve a number of relaying through channels, and this is a technical difficulty that is peculiar to any UN meeting. However, we should bear in mind that such interpretation allows for an inclusive process involving all stakeholders. The time frame for discussion in the working group was limited to four hours midday in Vienna to allow for participation from the far west to the far east officials in Beijing. While 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. and 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. was the most reasonable time we could identify, this still means that meeting starts at 4 a.m. in Mexico City and ends at midnight in Beijing. And this uh, time zone issue is something that will arise as we talk about remote hearings. Uh, in short, COVID-19 has posed certain challenges to the negotiations at UNCETRAL, but we are trying hard to overcome them. Uh, at the end, the working group agreed that a general role should be a, ge a general role should be provided in the expedited arbitration provisions that would address the possibility for the arbitral tribunal to utilize different means of communications during the proceedings and to make use of virtual and remote hearings. But it was emphasized that it should be made clear that the inclusion of such a role in the expedited arbitration context did not imply that the use of technological means was available, not available to arbitrary tribunals in non-expedited cases. The main rationale of the working group was that such a rule, if it was to be included in the expedited arbitration provisions, would not only recommend the arbitrary tribunal to make use of such technology, but also empower them with the express discretion to make use of technology to expedite the process and to save costs. And this would address possible due process concerns that arise from the use of technology. Just as an example, you may be aware of a recent decision by an Austrian Supreme Court in which one of the parties challenged the tribunal members for their decision to hold a hearing remotely in light of the tra travel restrictions at 3 p.m. in Vienna. And this was 6 a.m. where the party's counsel and witnesses were located. The Austrian court rejected the challenge and confirmed the tribunal's power to hold remote hearings. An express rule in the expert arbitration provisions would address any doubts about such utilization. So please stay tuned uh, as the expedited arbitration provisions are scheduled to be adopted by the commission next summer. And as mentioned to you earlier, the mediation rules and the notes on mediation would also be adopted by the commission next year. And they will also be reviewed by the working group prior to the commission session. Uh, as to future work at UNCETRAL, a number of developments. Uh, this September, the commission reaffirmed that UNCETRAL played a central and coordinating role within the UN system in addressing legal issues that relate to digital economy and digital trade. The commission requested the secretariat to continue to develop the taxonomy and requested the secretariat to organize colloquiums to refine the scope of the topics identified in the work plan and any other topics identified by the secretariat in its ongoing exploratory work. This included work in dispute resolution and platforms and they are supposed to be presented to the commission for concrete legislative work at its next session in 2021. Now, this work will encompass the proposal made by Israel and Japan last year to conduct exploratory work on dispute resolution in the high-tech industry. The commission also considered a proposal that the secretariat should conduct activities, including research and the hosting of expert group meetings, webinars, and online consultations to collect and compile information on the latest trends regarding international dispute resolution. The proposal noted that the, that the crisis caused by COVID-19 and highlighted the need to improve resilience towards such global crisis and to achieve modernization in particular in the area of dispute resolution. It was suggested that there was a need to monitor the changing landscape of dispute resolutions, the evolving practices, 
in the development of new forms of dispute resolution. Uh, there was general support for the Secretariat to conduct research and take stock of the wide range of developments in the area. And it was widely felt that the Secretariat should be given the flexibility in carrying out the activities mentioned. Uh, in light of the support received, the Commission requested the Secretariat to explore possible means to implement such activities and report back to the Commission next year as well. Uh, last but not least, uh, earlier this month, Hong Kong Department of Justice established a liaison office for collaboration with UNSETRO and will soon launch the inclusive global legal innovation platform on online dispute resolution. The objective of the platform is to keep track of developments and, and issues arising from the application of emerging, emerging technologies in so-called online dispute resolution and to provide an inclusive forum which facilitates continued discussion, collaborative knowledge sharing, and creative problem solving. The platform would further explore, discuss, and develop, develop innovative legal tools to address novel issues arising from the use of ODR and facilitate the harmonization of new and existing legal tools. What we hope to do is to hold a number of conferences and expert group meetings during the first three months of 2021 to collect information and to engage with experts on possible future work by UNSETRO with respect to what I have mentioned. The main components would be the use of technology in traditional dispute resolution, such as remote case management conferences, hearings, and taking of AE evidence, which would build on the virtual panel that I had mentioned and discussions at working group two on expert other arbitration provisions. It would also include dispute resolutions involving the high tech industry and this could be reviewed in uh, connection with the work on data transactions. Uh, we would also have the online dispute resolution component and could be uh, also linked with uh, work on trading platforms, which sometimes have, to have dispute resolution mechanisms inbuilt, as well as the role of AIs in dispute resolutions. And all of these initiatives could be packaged into the stock taking of developments in dispute resolutions and ways forward. Uh, our aim is to analyze the recent developments, identify any gaps, and seek areas where future work by UNSETRO, an intergovernmental body, would be explored and thus would include the review of existing UNSETRO texts and dispute resolutions. And here I would mention the 2016 UNSETRO technical notes on ODR as well. Uh, last but not least, I will simply note the ongoing work of UNSETRO Working Group 3 on investor state dispute settlement reform, which began in 2017. Now, the first phase was to identify concerns regarding ISDS, which took about two years. And the second phase was to consider the desirability of reforms in light of the identified concerns. The working group has now entered into its final and third phase, and it's developing reform options. The latest working group session was held in early October, also in hybrid fashion. And as to the substance that was discussed, they discussed dispute prevention and mitigation and other means of alternative dispute resolution, meaning other than arbitration, reflective loss and shareholder claims in ISDS, multiple proceedings, counterclaims, rules on security for costs to end those to address frivolous claims, treaty interpretation by state parties, and a multilateral instrument on ISDS reform. Uh, with that, working group has now reviewed all of the reform options. Uh, in to October, 2019, they discussed uh, the advisory center on ISDS, a code of conduct and, and, a third party, uh, uh, and rules on third party funding. And January this year, uh, the working group also considered an appellate mechanism, a standing multilateral investment court and issues relating to the selection and appointment of arbitrators and adjudicators in ISDS. Uh, in other words, the working group has now undertaken a preliminary considerations of the relevant issues with the goal of clarifying, defining, and elaborating the reform options. Of course, this was done without prejudice to any delegation's final positions and would be left to states to implement at a later stage. We expect the negotiations to continue despite the current circumstances. With that, let me conclude. And I hope by now you have an overview of what's going on at UNSETRAL with regard to dispute settlement. Uh, let me reiterate 
that it may be worth your time to carefully look at what's happening at Onsetro. And please visit our Onsetro website and keep alert of the new developments. As mentioned, we intend to conduct a review of the draft rules of the International Arbitration Court, Chamber of Arbitrators at the Union of Lawyers, and the 2014 revised version of the arbitration law of Belarus in the coming days and to revert to the relevant authorities. Uh, many thanks, and I'll be happy uh, to see you in person next time I'm in Belarus. Many thanks. Thank you. <laughs>